So welcome to the uh, March, it's not February, it's March 2nd, 2024 PCR Coast Division meet. Um, so just three very simple things. I wanted to give you a very quick auction update. Um, wanted to, uh, we're going to do the early bird drawing for the two giveaways from the early bird, and then we'll just drop into modeling. And David's actually going to go ahead and run that. One of the things that I've asked David to do, because it's kind of sometimes challenging for me to get here on Saturdays, is to be at a point where he can take these over and may run them more, more of the time. So um, with that, let me jump into this. So just a, a couple of real quick updates on the convention. We're you know, getting to be about, I guess now six, seven weeks out from the convention. And the good news is that I, if you kind of think the convention is something that gets baked over about a year period, I think we're at the point where it's pretty much pretty much completely baked. Um, so some highlights, and you see all of this on the website. I'm going to be doing some updates on the website today, but they're all up there. Um, we did announce the Niles Canyon Railway Yard and Shop Tour. Um, so that'll be on Friday. Uh, basically, drive out to Niles from Milpita. It's about a 25-minute drive. Um, then we'll have we'll start with lunch. Um, the Niles crew is going to put a lunch together. The menu is up on the website. Uh, then there will be uh, yard and shop tours. And the idea is to kind of break up into some smaller groups, be able to do yard and shop tours. And they'll also have the M200 rail bus running. So it'll be, you know, be able to take rail bus rides there. This will all be out of Brightside. So probably the rail bus from Brightside to Sonol maybe on the other side, way down into the canyon a little bit. So just kind of in that area. Um, it's $20. That covers the lunch and having the M200 running for us. So I think that's going to be a pretty cool tour and very worthwhile doing. Um, Doug Debs, who is um, one of the key volunteers out at uh, Niles Canyon, is going to come in and do a talk at our banquet dinner about early railroads in the Bay Area and then get very focused on kind of how Niles Canyon evolved as the railroads evolved and then talk about how they how you know the Niles Canyon Railroad was was founded you know how the Pacific Locomotive Association was founded and then took over control of the right of way the the old SP right of way that goes through the canyon there and turned it into their um their uh their uh, their new uh their railroad through the canyon so that should be very interesting. I think it's a, an interesting story about all the challenges that came with getting that put together and also how the railroads really changed the Bay Area. Um, we actually have over 40 layouts open. Uh, if you go up on the website, you'll see that they're now arranged into um, tours on days. Um, and if you go look, you'll find that each of those tours now is laid out individually. So you can see you know, which layouts are open each day and which tour location and decide which ones you want to do. So you can actually begin to plan your your trip and say, you know, do I want to go to, you know, Niles Canyon on Friday or do I want to do one of the layout tours? Of course, one of the nice things is the Far East Bay layouts will be open Friday and the Niles Canyon is in that area. So you can go to Niles Canyon and then, you know, if you decide to leave at 3.30, hit a couple of layouts before um, the end of the uh, the end of the, the tours for that day. Um, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, I think we're up to 42 of our clinic slots have been filled. Um, there are about three left. So if you want, if you're thinking about doing a clinic or would like to do a clinic, this is kind of the last chance to, to, to uh, submit your clinic. Um, I'm and then planning of course, for one of those being Larry. Yep. What Larry, yeah, we put some pressure on poor Larry here. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. I've got my, uh, well, you can't see it, but uh, I've got my manual for uh, what we used to do on the railroad to measure traffic. So nice, cool, nice. Um, and then, of course, you know, the things that have been there—the vendor swap meet, the convention car. One thing, um, and this is something I'm going to get on the website today: uh, daylight sales. Um, unfortunately, wasn't able to come for the whole event, and quite frankly, we don't have enough tables to let them spread out a lot of merchandise. But what they're going to do is come on Saturday. Um, and they'll have a table in the vendor area on Saturday. And if you want to order anything from them, if you mark it for local pickup, they will bring it on Saturday. So if you want to order a shirt and you don't want to pay the, the $7 shipping, you can mark it for local pickup and then pick it up on Saturday at the convention. Um, and then, of course, the virtual convention. I think we're up to last I looked, we're over 50 registrations for the virtual convention. 
getting a lot more registrations from out of the area. So that looks pretty exciting. So the next thing I wanted to do here was to uh, do our early bird drawing. So our early bird drawing is basically anyone that was registered um, before January 15th is automatically entered in the early bird drawing. So what we've done is we've taken all those names, put them in a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet ha is, um, has a random number generator with it. So I'm going to show you guys. This is, this is basically, so essentially these are all the names over here. They're just, you know, if you've used spreadsheets, you know this. They're just a bunch of call uh, rows. Uh, you know, so we have 110, but there's a heading, so that's 109 rows. And simply all these are is this is a random number between 1 and 109. So basically every time I put a new number in here, and the sheet recalculates, we get re new random numbers. So, um, and then I also have a listing from the hotel for everyone who's registered for a room. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically, uh, I'm gonna go back over here and I'm gonna put a new number in and we're gonna draw the actual numbers for the, the drawing. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with drawing one and if that's someone who's registered at the hotel, they'll get the suite upgrade. If it's someone who's not registered at the hotel, they will get the uh, $50 gift certificate. And then we will look at the other three until we find somebody who's got a hotel room to give the suite to. So does that make sense to everyone? It's kind of a way to structure it because it didn't make sense to give a suite upgrade to someone who didn't have a hotel room who's <laughs> local because it wouldn't be of a great deal of value to you. So we kind of came up with that way when we talked about how to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here um, a new number, and we're going to hit it once, and that's our random number. So our first number is 33, which is Anna Salas. So let me see if Anna Salas. Hey, Anna's Phil, yes. Phil, that's my wife, so let's exclude my wife and myself from that. Ah, okay, then I will do, then we will just, I'm not going to hit this again because we did it once, so we will just jump to number 14, and 14 is Paul Deese. And I know Paul Deese is, is in fact registered. So Paul Deese is our sweet upgrade. And in fact, I, I think he may be, hopefully he's coming with his wife. So we'll have a little bit of an upgrade there. Um, so our next, our, that's our, our giveaway for the room is bought for the upgrade is Paul Deese. So number four is our next one. And our next, and that's Jeff Howe. And so Jeff Howe is the winner of the $50 gift certificate. So I will get those two written down and we will go ahead and communicate with them. So with that, I'm just going to open it up for uh, just any conversations anyone would like to have. Um, just open modeling discussions, what you've been modeling, what you've been doing, any comments, suggestions, um, et cetera. Oh, Very quiet. Okay, so, uh, so so Dave. Yes, sir. On my clinic, okay. I I found my manuals, and I also found some background material that somebody had written up about it. Good. But I also found one thing that's important that I had completely forgotten. Uh huh. And uh, there are these little mm -hmm. yellow cards that were in my manual. Mm -hmm. I forgot that I had given classes <laughs> railroad personnel on all this. Ah, all right. And these little cards are what I use to uh, give those classes. So I'm going to go review these and see Good. If into the uh, into my presentation. All right. Let's uh, off later on today. What time would you be available to uh, work with me on that? Uh, Any time except 4 p.m. Well, it's between noon and four, and then five and later. How about 1 p.m.? Yeah, that'd be okay. Okay, thank you guys. This is just some clinic business. Are any anybody who's on here that I haven't already pestered? <laughs> I know Fran has already very kindly offered two clinics. Joe is honorably excused from doing clinics due to very good reasons. <laughs> I'm hitting up Larry now. Um, and anybody else who hasn't, who will be attending the, hello, Mr. Ekman. Anybody else who is attending the convention who hasn't offered to do a clinic, this is your uh, opportunity. But, uh, Phil, I'm also, of course, working people off my, my list of, of people I'm communicating with. I need to know 
uh, I'll talk to you offline, Phil, on, on when I pull the plug on, on trying to drag more people in. Um, yeah. But that's, that's okay. So that's clinic business. I don't know whether this will show up. Um, this is what I'm working on right now and what goes behind it. This is the first thing behind this unit. This is a Concore baggage in phase three color scheme. And I have nine Cato Superliner cars. Uh, couplers have been body mounted, you know, fixed and ver addressed various things. And now I need to get the interiors painted, people put in the train. But what's interesting is, is this thing is a, um, what you call it? This is a Bachman Spectrum. And I didn't realize it until I scrounged a couple off of eBay that Spectrum equipment varies. Bachman Spectrum equipment varies in the quality of the models. I didn't realize it until I got these, tore them down. And the trucks, for example, there aren't actually bearings in these trucks. The axles just snap into the plastic side frames of the trucks. There's no no separate metal bearings, for example. And other other little things like the coupler mounts stink out loud in the dark. And um, it's been educational. Uh, I have gotten this one running, got DCC in it and stuff, but um, it's it's been a uh, an interesting thing. I finally broke down and I just got my hands on two Cato F40 pHs. And um, I think what I'm going to have to do is uh, do the Cato's and then keep the um, Bachman's as backup power. But uh, it's been a, an interesting project. The one thing that the, these guys have is you can see the little strobes here, which are three millimeter white LEDs. And they work pretty well. Uh, they're pretty obvious. The strobe is flashing, and I like having that detail. But that's what I've been been working on is I just got this bee in my bonnet some time ago because uh, my wife, pardon me, a previous wife, yeah, I know, a previous wife, and I rode the Coast Starlight back in the 1980s. And so this is my model of that train and uh, being a, an interesting project, although uh, not inexpensive, as you might guess, getting the Cato stuff, which is out of production off of eBay. They, uh, they don't come cheap, but you guys probably knew that. That's, that's what I've been, uh, been working on when I haven't been pestering people about doing clinics. And you've yes. done a good job pestering people about clinics. Ah, well, I started too late, as Phil can let you know. Um, and so it's been a busy game of catch up, but everybody's been very, um, been good sports about being pestered about doing clinics and many have stepped up to the plate. So we're gonna have a good slate of clinics and I actually need to get my soldering clinic PowerPoint put together. Um, no, wait, not the soldering, the car check-in clinic PowerPoint put together. So I've got to get busy on that too and work on my layout, which I've put into the layout tour, which ought to provide some amusement to those who come to see it on Saturday uh, afternoon because it's uh, not a gigantic railroad. And uh, so, but, you know, it's what I'm working on. Dave? Um, yes, sir. The thing I've got a, um, and a suggestion for populating your uh, cars uh, fairly inexpensively. Yeah. Is you find it, there's a circus set of people watch, uh, the, you know, attendees at the circus. Oh, yes. Making a note. And it was just huge, you know, like, Three or four sprues of, of about 25 people each. Circus audience figures in HO. I'll see if I can find the, the, the um, I, and if, if not, I've even got a couple extras. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So I missed some, I, I was waiting to talk about something till John, John Cockle came. Um, so John, are you on and ready to talk a little bit? So can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. It's good. So 
Uh, you know, we've got let me, okay. no, no, before so I throw I'm, this. I'm, I gotta I give you a disclosure. Let me give you a disclosure here first. I'm up in the mountains up in Tuolumne County, and oh. a massive tree come down the street and uh, knocked knocked out the power and everything. So I'm running right now off of a one bar off the cell tower across the valley. So drop. Well, one bar wasn't enough. Exactly as he said, drop out. <laughs> so so John was going to talk about, we we kind of set up, he was going to talk about and present some stuff about March 10th. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think he's going to be able to do that. So that's a week from Sunday, a week from tomorrow. Uh, Mir oh, John's back. Here we go. Yeah, John, I'm not sure your cell coverage is good enough. So I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, we can. Go for it. Okay, I stepped outside. I stepped outside the back porch here. So yeah, I guess I jinxed myself because as soon as I said if I drop out, then I dropped out, right? So uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But did you want an update on the on the Redwood Valley uh, Tilden Park? Absolutely. Yeah. Tell, tell everybody okay. a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So next. Uh, yeah, it's next uh, Sunday, uh, tomorrow, uh, we've got a behind-the-scenes tour set up at up at Redwood Valley Railway up at Tilden Park. My son um, uh, is one of the locomotive engineers up there and uh, and shop people, and so uh, we've made arrangements to get a, a behind-the-scenes uh, steam up and and um, uh, see how all that goes. A couple of shop tours of both the the kind of the, the shop and also the roundhouse where they service the locomotives and that. And then they're going to take a special train out for us, uh, do a couple of laps around. Uh, I'll see if I can talk them in, maybe doing some photo run bys and that kind of stuff. So we'll see. If you haven't been up there, I'm sure most people have been up there, but it's actually a live seam, rare 15 inch gauge. Uh, all the locomotives. Uh, power than like at the Oakland Zoo where it's got a putt putt, you know, motor on it, that kind of stuff. Oh. Well, that, this may be a multiple, multiple conversation. So, oh, John's back. Yeah, I had one uh, question. Um, I, at the moment, I'm slightly disabled and I'm just wondering how much walking uh, would be required. I'm going to let John respond to that. Yeah, I caught the very end of that. It's so the question is, little, if for um, folks, what, what are the accessibility challenges, John? Just real quickly for anyone who has, you know, potentially accessibility issues. Yeah, so to to uh, walk between the shops and, and kind of get up to the upper uh, barn and, and shop where they do the machine shop, it's on a... Uh, unpaved uh, trail this is all stuff that's not accessible to the public so they don't they're not ada accessible uh, from that standpoint but uh, for the platform and the train ride and and that uh, uh, you know that part is uh, accessible so uh, and then i cut out there we are going to go down to golden gate live steamers is right next to them and and the path going down the golden gate is is paved and it's um, i think it's ada accessible and and so that should be a uh, appropriate, but uh, I sort of uh, getting yeah, into the shop I'm building sure, yeah. and, and getting up to the upper shop uh, is not. Yeah. I know I assume it yeah, would be ADA compliant, but uh, um, the shop area is, is tourist, and I'm not walking too well these days. Yeah, I would I would advise probably probably not then because like I said, it's it's through the redwood trees and it's uneven whole kind of set up and uh so uh, you might you might want to you know, consider all that i'll take a real close google and take a look yep good idea yeah yeah they have a they have a website i think and then they might have more information but again we're if we're doing the behind the scenes uh, piece that that I, I would say that that's not so just to be honest so yeah, behind the scenes they're not set up for that but it should be a good should be a good day um, if we show up between 9.30 and 10. Uh, and then um, we're going to do the, the tour and all that and a couple rides. They open up for public rides at 11. 
And so we'll probably be riding with them until about 1130 or so on a, on our own train. And then we'll go down to uh, Golden Gate Live Steamers or, or Giggles as it's known and uh, see what they're all about. Probably be there till maybe 1230, 1 o'clock. And then I do have three uh, layouts lined up in the Berkeley uh, El Cerrito area. And I'm, I'm kind of bird dogging some more, but myself, Jim Radke, and um, Chuck uh, Araftic, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, yep. We've got at least three committed to just being open, a drop in, you know, say hello, see the layout, that kind of stuff. Um, it won't be any formal op sessions in that, but uh, we'll get out a map and I'll have some uh, maps uh, printed up um, for Saturday too, uh, showing the locations and the addresses there. A nice convention warm up. That's true. But yeah, exactly. A convention warm up. Lunch will be on your own, and I'm I'm I've I've been tasked by uh, by Phil here to come up with some ideas. I live in Berkeley, and so I'll come up with some ideas. Kind of you know, as you come down off of Grizzly Peak, uh, if there's some ideas, there's a, a Barney's Burgers and some other just kind of basic stuff, um, sandwiches and that kind of stuff. And then lunch will be on your own. And then the layouts, like I said, I've been asking people from one to four to be open. So that's kind of that, that time frame. It should be fun. I, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, I, uh, I tell people. Connections here, but. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, John. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, the disadvantage disadvantages. That he's going at all considering the storm, I think, is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I was saying, you know, it's interesting. I don't know. I multiple multiple folks have been on the last couple we've been on, but I, yeah, you know, I have to say that. Both of the last tours we've taken, the Niles Canyon one and the Roaring Camp one, there was at least something that came out of that that was intriguing that you learned that was very interesting. Uh, you know, we went to the Niles Canyon one, the the Krauss Mafia engine and kind of the story of the cultural difference between German engineering and locomotive maintenance and U.S. engineering and locative maintenance, I thought was an incredibly interesting thing and that they're restoring that. And then we were down at Roaring Camp. I know, you know, we, unfortunately, we only had about 10 people at Roaring Camp. But, you know, the interesting question at Roaring Camp that came out of that visit was, how do you start a cold steam milk locomotive that's oil fired? <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting question because it turns out the way you burn oil is you have to atomize it. You know, you have to spray it. If you think about fuel injectors and that, they spray things in because you've got to have the 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 oil or gasoline has to become a vapor spray, and that's what burns. If it's just a liquid, old old, you know, oil, heavy oil, liquid, just doesn't burn that well. So if you don't have any steam pressure to heat the to do the the atomization, um, you can't have a fire. So, you know, if you go back in the old days, they used to do it sometimes by starting a fire with wood and heating it with steam. Um, a lot of times in the roundhouse, they would have the boilers set up where they could pipe steam from a fixed boiler in the roundhouse to the engines to start them. And then a lot of times, uh, you know, they would have a shunt engine that would have steam hoses on. If you look, you can see those sometimes and they could pull up to an engine and connect up and actually give it the steam to get the injectors running to get it heated up. So the question is, if you're running a railroad like Roaring Camp and you don't have a boiler in your shop and you don't have a shunt engine and you really don't want to build fire, how do you do it? And so we got there on that Sunday, on that Saturday morning, all of a sudden they pulled out a hose from the shop and plugged it into a quick connect on the side of the engine and opened a valve. And what they do is they use natural gas to start the burner off. And they run the burner on natural gas for about 45 minutes to get the engine heated up. And then they've got enough steam pressure to run the atomizer and they switch over to oil. And I, I thought that whole thought process, I, I would never have thought about that. I just find it a very interesting, you know, how you do this and thinking about how different it is. We just, we're, we're so used to getting in a car or, or quite frankly, getting in a locomotive, you hit a button and it starts up. We don't think about the process 
that they used to have to go through to get these engines started. So I thought that was, I'm hopefully, I'm looking forward to learning a couple of things similarly up at Tilden uh, next weekend, uh, things that I never knew before. So I don't think they burn bunker, do they? I don't know. <laughs> they probably burn uh, used vegetable oil. It's Berkeley. Yeah. Do they have a list of the open houses? Oh, the layouts? Yes. For I next Sunday? It... Yes. I think John said it's himself, his layout, Jim. Um, Jim, Jim Radke's layout, which is, you know, very much a big operational layout that is under construction is probably the right word. Um, and then um, Chuck um, Chuck's layout, which is, if you've never been there, just an amazing layout to see. So there'll be at least three, and hopefully we'll get, uh, we'd probably hopefully get at least one or two more. So this is not tomorrow. This is next week. This is a week from tomorrow. Yes, this is March 10th. And, and I'll get an email out with more detail, um, probably about Wednesday or Thursday. But um, yeah, it's March 10th, next March 10th, which is next Sunday. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. But by the way, speaking of layouts, um, I actually uh, last night, um, ended up talking to Daniel Niemeyer. Um, has anybody been to Daniel Niemeyer's layout? So Daniel Niemeyer lives in Oakland. And when you get his layout, um, he'll be open for the on Saturday at the convention. I don't think he'll be open next Sunday. Didn't set that up. But on Saturday on the convention, he'll be open. And when you get his address, it's an address in Oakland. And the apartment number is 2503 or 2403, I think it is. And so you end up pulling on, you know, I use Waze, you pull up and you're driving to the building and you pull up and you literally drive right to the edge of Lake Merritt and you turn left and it says you've arrived and you look look there and it's a about a 30 story condo building on the edge of Lake Merritt. And um, so you park and you go into the doorman and doorman mm -hmm. says, oh yeah, go up the 24th floor. You ah. go up the 24th floor you walk in, there's a door with a cross buck up by the door. You, you know, knock, open the door. You walk into a room and the building's about probably 70, 60, 70 feet on its side. And you walk into a room and literally you've got a 50 foot wall of glass that starts uh -oh. about two and a half feet off the floor and goes to the ceiling. And on the right, you can see San Francisco. And on the left, you can see the Berkeley Hills and you can see all of San Jose because it's looking out over the lake. There's nobody in front of you and built in front of that is an S gauge layout. That is oh, just oh. amazing. So I talked to him. He's going to be open. I really, one of the layouts, I, I really think it's, if you get a chance to go see it during the convention, you absolutely shouldn't miss it. It's, it is one of the most startling things to see, to, to look, be, look at the layout and then look at, you know, you got the layout in front and you look behind and there's this incredible view of the city and stuff. What he and his wife did was they uh, they moved into this building and his wife had actually suggested to him he should take his S gauge trains and set them up previously. So when they moved in, he said, well, you know, I really would like to have a place for the train. She said, well, let's just buy two condos. So they bought oh. two condos and the second one was set up as his office and the layout was basically opened up completely into one big room and uh, pretty impressive. So if you get a chance, um, well worth seeing. And by the way, the Vargas brothers built most of the layout. So it's pretty amazing quality. Now, what is he modeling? Um, it's, it's East coast, New York. Kind of wrong backdrop up then. It, it's the wrong backdrop. You're right. <laughs> I, un unfortunately, you know, depending upon your view the, the, tour is going to be during the day i happened to visit at night it was very interesting at night uh, with the lighted view out behind but but like i said it's one of those really cool layouts to go see and kind of an amazing location so kind of sell you on coming to the convention if you haven't already signed up so who else has been doing some interesting modeling Anybody? Well, my, mine's, mine's a bit extreme. I'm raising the foundation of my house at one end, four and a half inches. I gotta get that done before I can actually start building the railroad. Oh, is this you're adjusting your house to get the right coupler heights to NMRA standards? Correct. Correct. There we go. Okay. Thank you. 
What? Why? Just out of curiosity, Pat. Why are you raising the foundation of the house? Has the house settled, or it's it's it's, it's a forty-year-old house, and from one from the southeast corner to the northwest corner, it's settled four and a half inches. Uh, it's on a it's on a slab, and it's, it's settled to where April first. That's supposed to start working. Wow. So this is where if you put a marble on the floor, it just merrily rolls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but one hopes your bedroom is on the high end, so it's easy to roll down to breakfast. <laughs> Actually, Pat, take advantage of that. That means that you can put a grade on your railroad, but you don't have right. to worry about the cars rolling down. But I'm modeling <laughs> East Oakland, which has no grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, but if you built the layout at a four percent, a certain exactly. grade, it would match Just, perfectly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh, mm -hmm. okay. So we've got Pat's modeling, which is on his house. Anybody else doing some interesting modeling here in this? Sure, quiet... we got stuff. All right, what you got? Um, so um, I'm I'm working on a. Can I share my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm working on a. Um, let me just. So this is uh, uh, what I'm building in my office, which is where I'm sitting. It's about an eight by 12 room. Mm. So <clears throat> I decided that I was gonna have a space on my left for uh, building and testing modules. I'm gonna do my modular layout in my garage, but I'm gonna build and test and play mm. with them in my office here. So I have a CCCON 34 foot module in development on my left. Um, and then it comes around a corner and then I'm implementing um, Ingle Nook Siding, which is not as um, well known as Time Saver, but Time Saver didn't fit. And this is basically a small British switching puzzle that's going to be in the uh, in front of me. And then it's going to swing around behind me onto uh, uh, a standard gauge interchange. Uh, and so this is my in-office layout. I always wanted to have a train layout in my office. And so um, I'm doing that now. Um, on the way to doing it, I decided that although the module has a Tortoise DCC controlled a switch machine and a KD uncoupler, um, I didn't want to do that here because everything is literally, I can touch the track in front of me if I reach forward. So this is sort of the, the view of mm. my computer desk is the stand-up desk on the left. I have a modeling desk, which is uh, the, the uh, uh, butcher block on the right. And basically, Ingle Nook Sidings is going to be laid out in front of me. Um, and so after looking at a bunch of different um, uh, mechanisms for controlling switches, I decided um, on, on this, there's uh, a, a concentric brass sleeve that, that guides a brass throw rod that's bent, and that just goes straight up. It doesn't go through a pivot. It, it has enough... Um, enough. Uh, and then the last quarter inch is piano wire. Uh, uh, so this comes up to about uh, just to about the top of the pink foam. And then and then from that up is just the piano wire that goes into the switch. And then I, this is a prototype for what I was doing for my manual uncoupler. And these are the parts for the next generation version of my manual uncoupler that I'm about to put together. It basically has a pull choke that's going to uh, lift the uh, uh, neodymium magnets up to the uh, bottom of the Pico track. And I'm, I like using that for my um, uncoupler. So I'm, I'm just about to uh, put the uncoupler together and then I'm going to put it in the track right in front of me with the first switch um, this weekend. So that's, that's what I'm working on. So the, Oh, the magnets, uh, you've got a hole in the pink foam, so the magnets are get right up close to the ties. The, 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 the magnets go right up to the ties, touch the ties. Right. Um, Bob, I just got one question. Um, yeah. You said you're working on an English layout? Oh, um, yeah, let me, I, could, I don't have a picture of it. I have a, I can sort oh, of. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to no, say. No, no, it's not an English layout. I have a. I'm actually a narrow gauge Western. I want to do um, uh, 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 California narrow gauge, but there was a great, uh, like time saver, there's a great switching puzzle called Inglewood Sidings. 
Yes. There's no sightings. And so I'm implementing, and so it's basically, I need a, you know, a, a 35 in, with my locomotives, I need a 35 inch lead and then I need five cars and a three car and a three car siding. And so I'm implementing that on my layout so I can build a train using the switching puzzle and then send the train both to the standard gauge interchange and whatever module I have to drop off cars. And then I bring that stuff back to the siding and that's one puzzle run. And then we'll let somebody else see if they can do it better. Uh, mm. Now I've just got tons of uh, Southern Railway of England equipment that uh, ah. I is now surplus. No, I'm a North Pacific Coast Railway guy. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, eh? Worst case, that shelving could be nice paper, a place to put paper, extra papers, if you <laughs> slow down. Yeah, well, it's also designed that it's movable. I mean, it, 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 it. I, I may end up moving, and if I end up moving, this is going with me to whatever new office I go to. So it's it's absolutely designed to be portable and to integrate with testing modules, building and testing modules. It's part of it. And then I have a layout in front of me to play with while I'm on Zoom calls. I just can't use my 460 because <laughs> it has sound. But if I use the locomotives that don't have sound, I can play with trains while I'm on Zoom calls. <laughs> F8 will take care of that. Yeah. yeah. F8. Um, and, uh... I was curious, are you actually intending to cut into the wall to clear that curve as you come off the module? No, there's a window there. Ah, okay. And I had to do that to get, I figured I, by testing, I can get my 460 around a 20 inch curve. And so if I had a 21 inch, if I didn't do that, I couldn't get a four, a six foot module in. So it was no problems with a four foot module, but I want to do some six foot modules and I want to be able to test them in this room with this track. And I figured if I did a 20 inch radius curve and I sort of intruded into the windowsill area a little tiny bit, then I could have a six foot module with a quarter inch to spare. There you go. And parenthetically, this is a cantilevered room. So part of the room bolts to the house on this side and the other half of this house uh, is on some stilts and there is a slight slope on the floor, not four inches, but it's about <laughs> three quarters of an inch as you go across. And this, this confused me as I was generally, I plan from the floor up. And so instead I ended up planning from a horizontal run on the wall. And then I just used a level to track where I was going to go. And that's how I found that part of my floor was down three quarters of an inch. Yeah. <laughs> well, the other, the other approach is what I did in my garage layout here where the garage floor is sloped is I just put a T nut in the bottom of each leg and have a quarter 20 bolt. To, so I could get it fairly level to work around that. But that, that technique was from my modular railroading days. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes a, it makes a very nice, set up i got my module i got my desk i got the track in front of me it's going to go there's a bridge there's i'm going to make a mud flat bridge i decided i'm not doing a trestle i i'm a i'm an east bay mm. bay area east bay guy i'm i, I want to do a mud flat bridge across that and then over there is going to that's going to be my standard gauge i'm just going to run a piece of you know 4 foot standard gauge track because nothing makes narrow gauge look narrow gauge like standard gauge. Right. And I remember from being in the East Bay Club uh, in Emeryville, how grand the, uh, I was in the narrow gauge area of that mm -hmm. when I was a kid, but I remember how grand the standard gauge stuff was there. Yes. Well, that you just have to come over and visit us over at the Alameda County Central in Pleasanton, and yeah. you can sit there and look at one side and look at the O scale, and then switch over and look at the HO. And uh, my gosh, what a difference it is! I've been—I'm an HO guy, but some guy named uh, <laughs> Edholm <laughs> got me to help the guys in the O scale, and so I've been doing some work over there with more to do. But now I own an RSD 15 O scale locomotive in my goodness you go to pick the thing up after ho you know you reach over you grab it you go to pick it up and it goes no 
<laughs> you know, it just stays on the rail. Well, well, as somebody was talking about the differences in, in Bachman spectrum stuff, the difference in weight between the, my 260 and the 460 is staggering. Mm -hmm. the, four, the 460 feels like it's been full, you know, filled with, it's made of metal. The 260 feels like it's predominantly made of plastic. And yeah. It's very light. And so, you know, I think that, that you know, it's also the, what it's built like, because I think some of the O scale stuff is built like a tank. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, what I realized with the O scale stuff is the axle loadings in O scale are vastly greater. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been, as I've been working with the O scale people and looking at what happens to wheel bearings, because the loading per axle is so much higher. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the high end O scale stuff, they'll actually put ball bearings in there. And having seen what goes on with the equipment, I, that seems quite reasonable if you want to have it last for a while. It's pounds, not ounces. Yes. Yes. Sometimes multiple pounds. It's quite a, quite a difference. Oh, well, I have one other thing I'm going to, I wanted to mention. So here in Mont, I live in the Oakland Hills in Montclair. There's a, um, a restaurant called um, uh, the Egg Shop. And they have, um, since I moved here 25 years ago, they have a G-scale train that runs the length of the, the wall. And they have another O-scale train that runs the length of the wall. And I remember when we moved here, it was running all the time. And I've been there since, and it wasn't running. And my wife called me the other day and said, hey, why don't you talk to come? We're going to go have breakfast there and you're going to meet the owner, Miguel, and you're going to help him get his trains running again. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to help Miguel get his, um, he has beautiful locomotives all the way around, beautiful O scale locomotives no. in uh, cases on the wall. And um, we should get some NMRA stuff there because what? this is a place where kids see trains running. Yeah. John Selby, who used to own the Crossing Gate, helped get that set up back when it was a shop in Apple Press. And I don't think they're O scale. I think they're 132nd scale, actually. I, I don't know what it. they are. They're, they're it runs on G scale track. So it's probably 132nd scale. But yeah, John Selby, who used to own the Crossing Gate, which was up there in Montclair. Yep, yep. Uh, he, he got them started on that. And um, I think they went through a change of ownership at the restaurant. And that's when it became dormant for a while. So, so I'm going to get to find out what's there. Yeah. So, so coming back to the discussion of scale, I want to show you guys this. I actually wrote an article. It's going to be at some point in the uh, the NMRA magazine. Uh, show you this. Uh, this is the chart from that article. So the the real the real concept of the article is this idea that when you choose a scale, you're actually making a decision about two really important factors in model railroading. Um, if you look at area, when we think about the difference between you know, O and HO, or HO and N, you know, it becomes kind of almost a two to one ratio. It's not quite exactly, I understand it's 187th versus you know, the, one, the, the 196 that would have been at, at 148th doubled. But the reality is it's about a two X relationship. But in reality, in modeling, it's actually always an exponent of that relationship because you never model in one dimension. You always model in two or three dimensions. So if you think about area, that's two dimensions. So if you look at the, the green curve on the left, that's a two digit exponent curve that says, you know, if you start with the area you can model in Z, you start seeing that, you know, N is going to be almost a quarter of what you can do in Z, H, O, so on, down, S, O, G. On the right is detail, and detail is volume, so it's actually a cube relationship, so an exponential cube. So, you know, if you think about the relationship between O and HO from a volume perspective, it's actually about 7.8 to 1, which, by the way, is the weight thing. It's going to be eight times as much weight, and it's eight times as much volume. And so the idea is if you look kind of in the middle there between HO, S, and O, is kind of this changing relationship between area and detail. And mm. part of the article is the discussion that says that why narrow gauge, as you move to the right in this, in this diagram, narrow gauge becomes a really interesting option because I don't know if you've ever seen, there was a picture, and I, I'm trying to find an, uh, another one of it. It was a picture of 
an HO steam engine and um, transition box car next to an H an ON30 steam engine and Bachman box car. And it turns out the ON30 box car is smaller and the engine is actually just about the same size. And so, you know, the interesting perspective is you actually get to almost move a scale if you go to narrow gauge. So if you pick O narrow gauge, you get the detail, this amazing level of eight, seven point eight times as much detail, but you can model almost as much layout in the same area from a railroad perspective. You know, buildings are larger, but it's just an interesting way of thinking about it that, mm. you know, as you, you kind of analyze your interests in modeling and choosing a scale, it's this, this decision about the relationship between detail and how much you want to model. So interesting, interesting. I, I think it's a very interesting thought process. Um, you know, an HO kind of HO to S kind of becomes in many ways the sweet spot if you're doing standard gauge and then S to O becomes the sweet spot if you're doing narrow gauge. Mm. Yeah, yeah, your, your, your diagram is great. And it says that the, uh, that S scale should be the dominant scale because it's got the perfect balance between area. It, 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 and, and I do, I, <laughs> by, everybody by the way, who models in S will tell you that. <laughs> I, I did for new tracks. I did a video for the and the NSAG guys, and in the video, one of the things it says is S scales the Goldilocks scale. You know, it's kind of not, you know, it's kind of not too big, not too small. See, but but that's what I see. O N thirty four. See, if you if you're saying standard gauge, I would absolutely say that S is is extremely attractive. But then for narrow gauge, I get the area volume thing that i want because i couldn't have fit this layout in in standard gauge because it barely fit in 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 uh with a 20 inch radius curve and that's whatever you want to think about whatever i had to model in a in a in a gauge where i could model a 20 inch radius curve but just think yeah. of what you could have done in z bob 20 years ago yeah, I, know, I look at tom now i could have modeled the entire san luis obispo rail yards in here and that's what Tom did, right? That's crazy. Yeah, he that's that's the beauty of what he does. It's Ken like Adams? foot for foot rail yard. About 20 years ago, I was interested in the North Pacific Coast and doing it in F scale, which if those of you who know, G scale is sort of a toy gauge, whereas uh, F scale is the correct 20.1 uh, uh, to... Um, one ratio scale and and i i really because i i'm a modeler for more than than a, than a train guy uh was building the the the, the freight cars uh the, the the carter brothers freight cars that the north pacific coast had and they were enormous i mean you know yay i'm trying to get this in the frame if we can see it uh, for a box car that was only uh, a 30 inch or a 30 foot car or 25 foot car. Actually, 28, I think, was soon. So, I, there was a question in the chat um, about the NMRA National. And um, so, I, if everybody saw this, the national train show at the convention center was canceled um, in, in Long Beach. So, normally, what's happened at the NMRA conventions is there's the NMRA convention and it runs for basically Sunday to Sunday, but on Friday, Thursday, they set up and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is what's euphemistically called the national train show it tends to draw the big vendors. Um, you know, kind of, by the way, the train shows, we don't get like Amherst and that, or they do get a lot of the big vendors. It's somewhat similar to that, but it doesn't have typically has not had a lot of the, um, what I'm going to call the table vendors. You know, the vendors that set out tables and put a bunch of, you know, boxcars all over the tables. It tends to be more, you know, the large vendors like Bachman, Atlas, um, LGB, um, then tends to be a few large hobby shops that set up kind of a hobby shop you know, within the show. And then some of the, you know, I'll call them larger independent vendors and as attracts or stale trains or that kind of thing. Um, that event was canceled. Um, the reason for canceling, as I understand it, is that there were issues with the hotel around Dredge. Um, I, I don't know if you if you ever done anything with a hotel, but or excuse me, a convention center. A lot of times, the convention centers will have a stipulation you have to use their Dredge services. So 
basically you can't carry your own stuff into the convention center. You have to pay somebody to do it for you. <laughs> and that turned out to be a huge issue and, and was buried in, in what had happened and getting together and getting the hotel. So the decision was made that it was just not going to be economically viable. So what I, my understanding they've done is they're moving the train show from being a separate event to being at the hotel and be part of the convention between us. I actually think that may be better because mm -hmm. they may have the possibility of having more smaller vendors and more interesting thing for the attendees. Not a hundred percent sure, but it'll be interesting to see they're trying that this year may become the way of the future. Quite frankly. Um, the only other thing I've heard is that the narrow gauge layouts, normally there are not large or not narrow gauge, the modular layouts that are set up at the, uh, national train show they have a huge area normally for modular layouts typically 15 to 20 modular layouts what they're going to be doing in long beach is those will be in the hotel area but because they have limited area they're actually going to have two ships so some mm -hmm. of the modular layouts will be set up at the beginning of the week some of them, different ones will be set up at the end of the week in the same space uh, mm -hmm. but you know the the good news is that hopefully it'll be available for everybody during the convention we'll see how it works out you know, I, I, quite frankly, I, if you've been to both the NAS, the NMRA convention and the narrow gauge convention, um, what I find is I never buy anything at the national convention because I'm a narrow gauge modeler and there's just not that much selection there. And most of the people that are there are not selling things. They're either hobby shops that are things you can buy regularly at home. And I typically would buy at home or their vendors showing and just looking at what they're doing. I think it may actually be a lot. It may be a lot more interesting for the attendees of the convention, the way it's going to turn out this year. We'll just have to see how it goes. Uh, but I, you know, I think it's part of the evolution of trying to understand how to manage the national train show going forward. So. Yeah. The, tough this, choices. Uh, what happens when you go to a large city or major metro area for, for, for a convention. Now, if you've done it in Modesto, you <laughs> worry about that <laughs> yeah well, you know and, I, and so much many of us are used to the you know the typical train show we have the great train show where you know the concept of drage is totally unknown um everybody carries their own stuff and you watch all the vendors there and they care i mean and even if you go to the big train shows back east where they do have some of the vendors like you know a bachman or an atlas will show up um they typically do it all themselves there's not the concept but the big convention centers in big cities that do, you know, I remember when we used to do big trade, sh you know, big trade shows and high tech, uh, you know, they were completely done by these people. I mean, if you want to plug into the electrical system, you hired, had to hire $120 an hour electrician to plug the plug in for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's just that, that's kind of the way those venues work. And that's how they kind of manage the business. So they it's like they serve a different clientele. It's not, and, you know, in, on one hand, it sounds bad at the first cut. On the other hand, you know, from the perspective of attendees to the convention, I think it may actually end up being better. And I think there was already discussion next year, the convention is going to be in Michigan and it's actually a ways out from Detroit. And I think there was in that convention, there's already been a big discussion about what they do with the national train show at that convention. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Good, good. All, all, all sure. just part of changes. I have two things, Val. Sacramento, and, and the, there was a huge national train show there. And yep. it was every major vendor from God, everyone, across, uh, Europe as well as, as, as the U.S. Hey, hey, Pat, before you leave, Pat just left saying he's going to a San Leandro meeting. And Joe, you may want to give him a call and tell him that it's not happening. Okay, well, he's, there's there's a San Leandro uh, Zoom uh, okay. meeting anyhow of officers and things. I've uh, got okay. to leave for it, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> as, as, I'm, as, I'm, I'm, i got to go get on the San Leandro Zoom. <laughs> and Larry's got a meeting, too. Uh, uh -huh. I, had, I had two things, Phil. First yes. of all, that graph you have, you can put in two more curves. One curve availability of prototypes. In other words, how much variety is available in each scale? Yep. Then the other curve would be an inverted curve for cost per unit. That is, pick a locomotive that's available across the range from Z to G, and then what is the cost to buy? 
yep. that in each of the scales because that also I think plays into the choice that people make. Uh, the the first two you show are, are excellent, and I think a lot of people don't think about them. What they often more focus on is, geez, you mean how much do you want for a locomotive in this scale or that scale? And then how much, uh, how easy is it for me to find a particular Canadian prototype or a, you know, fill in the fill in the blank uh, prototype? Those were a couple of things. Then. The other thing here I was wondering about with, I don't know what we have left here, if some folks have headed out, which is I thought people who are offering clinics at the convention could say a few words about what they're going to be clinicking about. Dave, Friend, Dave, would you just, like to? Dave, yes. just to uh, follow on what you were saying about adding a curve to fill, the other thing to be nice is to show kind of a grand total because you'll find that the narrow gauge stuff may be more expensive, but you're buying less of it. So right. it's the same net cash outlay. Mm. <laughs> it's a so, complex matrix. Well, it is. Because the rails are closer together, I save money on shelving. <laughs> there you go. Oh, two, or, oh, and two and a half. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, think, I think Earl brought up a really interesting point, which is if you're modeling, you know, if you take a space and you build an HO layout in it, and you take the same space and you build an ON30 layout in it, the equipment you're going to need for the ON30 layout is probably going to be, you know, significantly less mm -hmm. than, than the, than the HO layout. And especially yeah. if you're doing more modern modeling. Yeah. But, but clearances, clearances don't, the, the track is the same gauge, but clearances aren't the same. So you actually have to have the tracks further apart and it yeah. takes further for you to get to, clearer on a divergent on a switch so you get fewer cars on a passing siding on a module that's six feet long in mm. on 30 than you do in ho something i figured out when i could not lay out time saver in the space that i wanted to <laughs> yep and one thing about availability you have to remember is that most narrow gauges did not interchange equipment with another railroad so you only have the one railroad to model Whereas if you're doing a standard gauge where you're in the U.S. prototype, you're dealing with, you know, a, a 120 different railroads, equipment possibilities that could show up on your section of the railroad. Hmm. So, Fran, 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 you've got your sharing. So I assume there's something there you, you wanted to show are, us. Are you seeing the three locomotives on the flat car? No, no. we're seeing the bridge. We're Pin seeing we're seeing your main screen with the bridge, bridge on it. It's beautiful. You know, we, most amazing. My modeling. computer runs two screens, and uh, every time picking which screen to share. So, so when you go to share, the screens will have numbers on there. Now we're seeing a bunch of pictures. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Well, I usually try number one. So this is uh, from uh, Sierra Nevada Wooden Lumber Company. Hobart Estates, Hobart Mills. These three Milwaukee locomotives, uh, the two on the, the left, the one on the left and the center are very early 1900 models. By the way, Milwaukee has, there's very slim records left uh, on Milwaukee production. Just, you know, a few catalogs here and there. Uh, and they're like five and eight ton small locomotives. The one on the right is thought to be from the 1920s. Uh, it looks to me, I've had, I've had different opinions, but it looks to me like these locomotives are being shipped out from, um, from Hobart Estates to wherever they're going to go, maybe for disposition. Brian, it's at yes. least after August 1937, because that flat car has a new 737 date on it. Okay. So you're saying this photo is after the, is in the thirties? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that would, that would make sense with this number three on the right being a 1924 model. Uh, so, so by the way, Fran, before just to make sure context for everyone, Fran is going to do a clinic on early gas locomotives. 
um, you know, early locomotives. And this is, these are the kinds of, of things he's going to talk about. By the way, I, I love the blocking there. The woods, the wood blocking where they put a, looks like at least a, probably at least a six by six stuff down into the coupler pockets. And then they've got a block wedged up against that wedged up against underneath the engines to hold them in place on side to side. I just see that and I look and I say to myself that if that's Milwaukee road power, they must have real trouble hauling trains in the mountains. Yeah, these are these are small switchers. This is the heaviest of them all, and this is the one that I cannot find in any catalog. You see, it's got the more solid side frames, um, probably cast. I don't know, it's but a solid yes. side frame. Um, uh, heavier. I'm, I'm estimating 15 tons, maybe, maybe heavier. But uh, I can't find a word or anything on on this locomotive. So that was my my challenge to to create it from the photo photographs. You see, at at Hobart Estates, at the lumber uh, Hobart Mills lumber yard, they just use these two I call them buffers, uh, two bumper boards with huh. with like automotive springs in between to push these carts around. Uh, uh, switching around a, a lumber mill or uh, without going out on a main line or any length of track uh, or any length of, of, of trip. Yeah. Um, so I started a... Uh, started some, some files, started to draw it with Tinkercad, which I'll do it. Uh, a one-hour clinic on Tinkercad, Tinkercad for model railroads. Um, so yeah, Sierra Nevada wooden lumber, Hobart Estates, a 1908, a 1910, and a 1924 locomotive. Um, There's the catalog of the. I think that's the 1908 version. <laughs> but of course, once they're once they're up in the in the uh, in the Sierras for a few years, uh, I think they have some modifications on them, like this box on the on the back here. Uh, uh, probably, a, possibly a tank. Um, don't, but really, just don't know. Very clearly, Milwaukee on the side frames and Milwaukee on the uh, like up over the radiator. Um, uh, I forget the date right now, but this is uh, from Narrow Gauge Gazette. Someone did a, an article, I think 1998, I think, um, with a couple photos of them, and that's the A and the B models. <laughs> but but what I was interested in is the the other one that's not um, designated A or B. This number three. Um, so let's see where I'm going here. Oh, there's the the carts that they uh, that they use, just Lincoln pin. Now those are basically buffer cart. Those are push cart buffer carts, right? Yeah, uh, the one, uh, this one, I think they could stack, they could stack lumber on it and push it around. But they would also they could also just be spacer cars. I yeah. I don't know for sure. This one you wouldn't you probably wouldn't stack lumber on it. You just need it for the spacing. Yep. Uh, so again, the the <laughs> uh, early models is fairly small. The uh, the number three is is bigger and higher. Um, by I don't I think by at least a foot. You see how how the floor seems to me the floor is raised in but here. If you step operate. back to the if you step back one step back one photo because I think that one the the one before I I'm mean that sure. basically the 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 frame if you look at the side row of the frame that almost looks more like a beam. Where yeah. the next one the next one is clearly cast because the Milwaukee is cast into that. That's a cat. That's a big cast side piece. Right, and otherwise, it, otherwise it's a a channel, 
Um, that's a channel, right? That's a channel. A channel beam, and it's a much lighter locomotive. And, and so. look at the track switch. It's one of those where turntable type uh, turnouts. Yeah. You load a, a on, and the whole thing sort of moves around. What gauge is this equipment, uh, Fran? I'm I'm pretty sure they're three uh, three foot. <laughs> Three foot. Um, I, I'm going by a Gazette article, which isn't. Looks like three foot. It looks more like three foot gauge. What's What's interesting on this? If you look at it, it's a leaf spring. There's a single leaf spring there that basically connects in the middle, and the wheel and the axles are off the ends of the leaf spring on either end. It's you know if you if you if you think about the way a car is generally sprung, the leaf spring's actually exactly opposite of that, right? It's connected to the car on the sides and the axles in the middle and the leaf spring goes down that's actually connected in the, it's a leaf spring connected in the middle with the two axles on the on the ends of it really interesting but very lightweight design i mean you think about look at how long those those axle those springs are and how thin they are and those are carrying the load of the engine on that versus the other one which because they went to the cast frame then they went on the next one to uh I think the coil springs that are inside the cast frame, if you look at the next yeah. one. So that's, I'm sure that's a lot of how they increased the weight on the locomotive was they totally changed the suspension. And what, what they needed was they needed more vertical travel within the suspension to put a coil spring in. So they went to a cast side frame. Fran? That's yeah. interesting. Did these things have an air compressor? They didn't need one, did they? No. Yeah, if you go back several pictures, check out the horn, the warning horn that the thing has. It's in one of the drawings. Um, I, I don't totally trust the drawing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's no one, there's no one to uh, contest the drawing. Look at, look at this. I'm, I'm thinking this is an exhaust. Yeah. And look, look up at the top. What is that? horizontal thing coming off of the exhaust. Hmm. I, I don't, I don't know. This, this, this is mysteries. Um, if, uh, if anyone has a better source for Milwaukee, um, I, uh, I exhausted my, uh, uh, my searches, like looking for a catalog. You would think this would be in a catalog and it's not. So um, hmm. just let's keep going here. So there was there was another article in the Gazette of a guy who who uh, built this. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, if you want more information on that, it's a pretty nice pretty nice job, but it's kind of freelance in between the A model, B model, and then the solid side frame. Um, there's my my parts. Um, yeah, there's, there's my, a, a set of printed parts. There's a, one of the, uh, one of my first tries. I like to see through grills. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I'm getting to the, uh, resolution limit as, as well as the material limit. On how fine I can make the uh, make something with this resin printer. Mm. Um, I'm actually afraid people will break them. So I've, I've made a couple with you know uh, what do you call it? wedding veil material. Mm. That you, uh, you you know what's a great screen material? If you go on Amazon, you can buy um, round pipe screens. And you can buy a hundred for about six bucks and they have them in different diameters. They go up to about a half an inch and they look like nice mesh, fine screen, and they're very inexpensive. Yeah. 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 I've used them. Some, a lot of them are stainless steel and they're kind of tough to cut. Yeah. Um, they, they, they are good and you, you can get them really fine, but that's where I'm looking good. Fran. I'm that's at on, on this. That's the second version. Again, I left out the uh, uh, the resin grill, and that one that one I I put uh, the wedding veil material. 
Yeah, I'm thinking next generation Amtrak power. <laughs> that looks great, friend. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Mm -hmm. There are the carts. Carts. Non non operable, but uh I could I could get real wheels and actually these are filament printed wheels, 3D printed wheels, and they're not, you know, they're not going to be operational. They're just going to be for scenery. Mm. And also now you can see you see the end grain. I got I got wood grain in them. Huh. Uh, Beautiful work, Fran. Yeah. The three D printing work is outstanding. Yeah, thanks. So what is your other clinic, Fran? Uh, one's on, on uh, the history of small gas locomotives, and I have to not take full credit for it. I'm doing, doing what I can uh, to supplement uh, Randy Hees' clinic from the 2019 Narrow Gauge Convention. Mm. Uh, he had given me a copy of it and uh, for, for building critters. I usually send him a critter when I build it. <laughs> and uh, I contacted him and asked if he was going to be in the area for the uh, for the convention, and he's not. But he he gave me full permission to use the clinic information, the PDFs, and and all that he gave me for anything I want to do. And so uh, I've got a lot of his slides. I don't have a whole lot of talk for it, and I don't expect to. It's going to be a lot of you know, maybe group participation and photos of many gas uh, locomotive, uh, you know, er early gas locomotives. And, you know, maybe before then I'll go over, uh, go over some of them. But there's, you know, there's really only about a dozen man manufacturers that I'll that I'll talk about Ford, Fordson, um, of course, Plymouth, Milwaukee. Uh, they're not coming to mind right now, but. Uh, a small, hey, Fran, got a question for you. Back a few slides ago, there was, and, and David called it out, kind of a funky switch that almost looked like part of a turntable. Yeah. What's that called? If anybody knows, you're asking the wrong guy here. Uh, I've forgotten that they, 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 they're all they were used in England extensively because of the short freight cars. Yeah, that slide. Um, and they use them in mines, as I understand it. Yeah. Okay, just wondered if anybody knew what they're called. Also, on the end of. Uh, uh, loading docks, um, maritime docks, mm. to get to get you know out off the dock and then make the 90, 90 degree Just turn. Like you'd have um, a huge warehouse, and you'd have all uh, or a freight shed, and you'd have these these little tiny turntables. And they'd move the twelve foot. They they were set for the twelve foot uh, wheelbase of of an English freight uh, open wagon. And mm. move them around. And they were moved by horses or, or manpower. Yep. Probably not that dissimilar to the way they turn the uh, the locomotive, they turn the the um, trolley cars, the uh, cable cars in San Francisco. Mm. That little turnaround that's manual. Yep. They call it a turntable there, but turn, that is it's more of a turntable there. But I can't remember. There was a specific name that was used in, in England for for the for this type of uh, yeah, switching. <laughs> so we have Fran's cars there. Oh, sorry, Ken. Okay. So so, um, so Fran's doing two clinics. Uh, I'll toot my own horn here. I'll be doing a clinic on soldering for model railroaders. I don't know if anybody in this group has taken the clinic. I've given it twice already. And this is hands-on, uh, not make and take so much as just make and, and practice to get experience, to give people more understanding of what makes soldering work and how to do a good job of it. That's one clinic. And I'm going to have a 
whole mess of soldering irons and stations where we can get groups of people to sit down to give everybody a chance. And then my other one's going to be on rolling stock standards based on a checklist where, you know, why each item in the checklist is important, how to accomplish it sort of thing. So those are my two clinics. Uh, of course, we have many others of all types, and uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, batch of things that will be on offer. Anybody else doing some interesting modeling? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I sit here at my workbench and I, I look I look at projects and I say, oh, I've got to get this done and never get to it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I, 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 go ahead, Phil. Unfortunately, I've been conventioning. I, in background, I've been planning where I'm, I, if there's some interest, I'll show I'm planning a, how to move my modules into a fixed space at the house, but that's coming together. Hopefully by the time the convention's done, I'll be ready to start building the next pieces. Good. So. Yeah. The, uh, for those of us that are in the convention, a lot of our modeling time is modeling a convention and one-to-one -one scale. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have to get the, of course, and if you're looking at it that way, you've got both the passengers we have to take care of, and then you got to have the, uh, the porters and the conductors and everybody else to run the convention train. And Phil, for good or for ill, Phil's the conduct, Phil's the engineer. Are you the conductor? I'm not sure which. He's the Phil. train master. He's the train master. No, it's really Earl. I'm, I'm just trying <laughs> to get some stuff done. I think you've been running it, Phil. <laughs> team effort. It's a yeah. team effort. Okay, I need to break away, guys. So, by by the way, just as a side, I um, John Wubble just replied, and I think he's going to send us a kit and. Uh, Kaufman Graphics is going to send us uh, is going to send us something. So, yeah, we're gonna we're going to uh, we're gonna well, get a lot of interesting uh, giveaways or door prizes door at prize. the event. So, that should be exciting. Yeah. And so, if if you guys are interested, I'll, I'll kind of show you some progress. Also, looking for some comments here. So, let me um, let me throw something up here in a. Uh, Oh, my computer is fighting me now. Why? What's going on here? There we go. I got too many, uh, clearly too much stuff over my computer. I upgraded my memory so I don't have to worry any longer about uh, losing memory. So, so I have a room. I uh, I finally nego I've negotiated with the uh, family um, to take the what was a game room and turn it into a um, turn it into a layout room. So this is um, this is basically I, I started I've been for like a year designing a kind of a South Pacific Coast layout in ON30 um, around the walls. So this is kind of a lower level starting with the mole in Oakland or in Alameda. This is Alameda running around in Newark, um, then Wrights, which is up on the hill, then a little bit of a helix here to come up. Um, Wrights is up here, actually on the hill here, then Felton, and then coming around through big trees to Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, what I realized is that it's going to take me five years to build this, and based on the way I move on things, and that means it's a long time. Plus, I've got the modules that I've built. So I decided after the last set of shows to uh, set my modules up in the room. So this is kind of these all exist. This is was set up until I took them down for the San Jose show. Um, what I've got is a couple of, of actually wings that are just plywood pieces that bolt on and have a leg that become staging yards. So mm -hmm. a staging yard on either end. Uh, this is a big module of Moss Landing. This is a, a module of a kind of a town that was originally in the Sierras. And this is Wilder Ranch within a couple of corners. So I got this set up. One of the things I realized was that the problem with building a layout like this in the room is there's no room in the room for anything except for being at the layout. And when I kind of looked at how many operators you can have in a room, if you want to do an operating session, it kind of is limited just because of the aisleway space to about five. 
when I set this up, I realized there were two advantages. Um, one is that, um, and this is kind of a picture of that setup. Um, and by the way, this is a roundhouse, or this is an engine house that's now at the uh, ACCRS Club in Pleasanton. Uh, we needed to have an engine house for our, we were doing a new engine facility there. Um, so basically, I've got, you know, the room for a table in the middle and some seating and that. And so what I decided after doing this that, gee, I can get to a layout much more quickly by using the modules. And it turns out I think it's a much more social environment. And it turns out you have just about the same amount of operations in that space. Yeah. So this is kind of what I'm looking to build. I, I don't say it's 100%, but it's getting close. So the dark green modules are ones that exist today. The light green are the three that I would build that I'm planning on building. So essentially what we've got is a, uh, a this is a, let's call it a staging yard, full train turntable that's long enough to take at about six, at about 50, 54 inches. Any of the trains that I would run, these are five, six car ON30 trains. And the idea is you can run a train in, roll this around. It'll be built to kind of look like one of the, the ferries on the bay, even though there's mm. not logically where it should be. Um, but the idea is you can run a train in, turn it around and run it back out. So, for example, if you want a passenger service, you can literally run the same train back and forth, north and south for passenger service. Um, the numbers here are the number of spots that are on the modules. So there's 14 spots on this module. Um, you know, it's the, these are the warehouse and, and building that I had at the convention last year. Um, there's a cannery, there's a, a fuel facility. There's a, the modern, the Monterey fuel pier is modeled. And then mm -hmm. over here is a car float. And so the idea is that, you know, this is one switching area. Then this module here becomes, I've called it Castroville because it kind of fits into the area. This is a beat loading ramp here. Um, some miscellaneous switching in these areas, an oil vendor here. Um, Wilder Ranch, which is a model of what might have been at Wilder Ranch, which is just north of Santa Cruz back in the 1920s, um, with a siding for a creamery and a siding over here for a, um, for a, uh, a stockyard. Um, one of the things I was struggled with a lot was originally I just had the track running through here, which meant I didn't have a siding in this area, which made it kind of hard to do operations. And what I realized was that if I put a turnout on this curve, I could bring the track out and actually run a three inch wide additional module, call it shelf, behind the, the module here that allows me to have a passing siding that runs from here around to here. What that means is that all the switching back in here can be done off the passing siding. Mm. Um, and then there's another passing siding here at Sierra City. This has four spots on it. And then the idea was to have a yard, which kind of replicates what was at Spreckles, um, which had the uh, the beet processing plant. So this is beet deliveries here and boxcars coming out with sugar here, um, an engine facility. And then going back to the comments that Bob made earlier, this is a narrow gauge to standard gauge interchange warehouse. And then a, ni a nice yard that gives me a re ability to have you know, some inbound receiving tracks and a runaround here, and then a couple of tracks to build trains that can be built in and out. Um, so basically, this is kind of what it looks like in schematic form. Um, you know, it basically, this is the main line. This is with all the sidings across the piece. It's about a 50-foot main line track. Um, one of the things that you do when you do this kind of a, a layout is you basically eliminate all the running distance between switching areas in the interest of kind of space and time. Um, this is kind of some basic data points on it. There are the three sidings, kind of how long they are. Uh, this is actually, from, what I'm trying to do is set this up so it can be an operation. So you essentially have the capability of having north and southbound freight trains. Um, there's a turn to go do the barge here. This becomes a really interesting switching operation because it, this has a 5% grade coming up this hill here. And if you limit it to one car on the grade at a time, and there are six cars down here on the float, it becomes a fairly interesting switching job to decide how to do that. Yeah. Um, the sugar turn, which basically takes the box cars from the sugar warehouse over here to, you know, from, from there back and forth 
to the beet processing plant. The idea here is that Spreckles was taking a significant amount of the sugar that they were producing, and instead of shipping it over the SP at the SP's usury rates, they were <laughs> shipping it by boat around to San Francisco because they did their, basically they did raw sugar. Uh, Spreckles, when he started, it started in, in Hawaii, and they produced raw sugar in Hawaii, shipped the raw sugar to San Francisco, and they did the final sugar processing to, you know, white white crystal sugar or powdered sugar in San Francisco. When they did the beet factories down, the beet plants down in um, down in the, uh, you know, the, the Salinas area, they actually sent that up to San Francisco as well. So that kind of models getting sugar and kind of creates a set of loads coming over there. Then there's another chain, which is the beet turn. And the beet turn takes the, the cars from the beet loading ramp over here to the factory. Um, and then I can have a passenger turn north and south and a speckled yard job. So it gives me really the ability to have about five, five, really probably five operators. And there's plenty of room here in the middle of the room for everybody to operate and, and kind of work. And if I, if I end up going to a, to an event, I can just, um, you know, take these modules out and the door, open the door here and take them and then put them back in. Um, and I'm kind of working now on some train schedules of different kinds of trains going through the layout. So I figure I get this all done while planning for the convention with the idea that when I get done, I can start building the modules and get it all installed and working. Question, Phil. Yes. Previous plan showed you, how should we put it, uh, making use of some of the space in that closet. Had you considered running off the interchange with the standard gauge and putting a return loop in there? No, the political consequences of that action are higher than I want to. Um, Understood. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> that would be considered an invasion. That was that was actually one of the problems with the larger fixed layout was that everything I designed required me to take over chunks of the closet. Right. Um, and in fact, one design I had had staging. It was actually designed with, you know, it was a more of a staging layout where there was staging in the closet on the two levels. Right. And that basically required me to take out. Um, a about an eight nine foot closet rod with all of the accumulated coats and ski crap of 50 years mm -hmm. and like i said the political consequences of that action are pretty high got it uh, <laughs> yeah well that's that's one of the realism uh, realistic things one has to mo work on in modeling yeah no it's it it's and, you know, I think that the idea of getting something going where you can do it more quickly yeah. um, is critical. And, and part of this is driven um, one of the one of the members of the ON30 group um, had a stroke and decided he couldn't participate in shows any longer and yeah. set his modules up in uh, a fixed configuration. And it turns out it's it actually works out really pretty well. I mean, you don't have. You don't have the 30 foot of run that you get you know, or 15 foot of run you might get in a larger layout between switching areas. But if you one of the things that's interesting is you think about how you manage the trains properly, you can set it up so you don't have two people trying to switch using the same tracks. In other words, when people are switching and in areas, they're in different areas as you as you kind of set up your operations. So the politics at uh, a place I lived in a long time ago with a different wife, for whatever reason, it was politically acceptable to put part of my big modular yard up against a wall with some hooks mounted in the wall to catch one edge of the modules, legs in the front, and bookshelves, because those were very politically important, bookshelves underneath. And yep. so you had this shelf model railroad, a big yard, and underneath was her books on bookcases and that worked politically yep well cool one of the reasons is easier to stay divorced after it <laughs> let's not go there i'm on wife three and i don't want to hear the d word anymore in my life okay <laughs> i've made my quota gentlemen i'm going to run away I've got to yep. get ready for a meeting with Larry Osorio and work on actually getting materials for one of my clinics, the PowerPoint, put together. So I better get my ass busy and I got people to write to about their clinics. So 
Thank you, Phil. Well, thanks, for David. Hosting. Have a have a good one, and we will. I, I, unless there unless there's uh, an objection, I'm going to go ahead and call it as well, mm -hmm. and uh, get going on some projects. And like I said, I didn't have to run, so that was good. I've had a have a great week, and you know, mark your calendars next Sunday in uh, Hilton Park. And it sounds it sounds like, by the way, that that restaurant might be an interesting option. I'll talk to John and see about it. I don't know I don't know about that what they have for lunch, but they could be it could be an interesting restaurant if they've got a railroad there. Yes, that so. does sound good. All right, thanks for setting this up. Thanks, again. guys. Have a great Take one. We'll, we'll see you back here in two weeks. Two. Weeks. Have a good one. Bye now.